And this week, uh, we're going to get going and hand it, I'm going to hand it over to Jack, talking about Knoxville football, the prehistory. Over to you, Jack. All right. All right. Thanks, Paul. And, and thanks, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, uh, football, of course, is something we take for granted. Uh, it's football time in Tennessee. Um, but uh, as you probably know, football is not southern in origin at all. Uh, in fact, by the 1890s, it was considered mostly a northeastern uh, Ivy League sport. Um, and uh, a knowledge of football, uh, if you lived in Knoxville, was kind of proof that you'd been to New York or, or, uh, or Boston recently. It was kind of a mark of sophistication um, for having been to the big city because uh, nobody else played football in the earliest days, uh, at least not in a big organized, uh, publicized way uh, outside of the Ivy League. Um, but the inspiration uh, came uh, before that, and, uh, and it's uh, uh, perhaps su surprisingly in, in ways that some football fans or out of your friends who are football fans might not want to admit, but it's partly, there might be a literary source behind uh, the uh, first uh, inspiration of football. And it had uh, at least a passing acquaintance with Knoxville uh, in, uh, in a way that I'm going to uh, talk about. I'll be kind of connecting dots uh, this time and, and suggesting what might have happened uh, to some extent. But there is some real, there are, also, are some real interesting uh, uh, developments uh, in the 18, 1880s and 90s uh, that we'll be talking about. Football may have begun with uh, an inspiration uh, from a literary source, a, a novel, in fact, a, a British novel um, called Tom Brown School Days. It was published in 1857. It was an international bestseller, and it was a very, very English novel. Uh, it was about, uh, about the, uh, the, the, what they call a public school, which we would call a private school uh, at, at rugby in England, uh, a boarding school there, um, and about a young man's experience with it. And I, I, I've compared it to uh, like, it's kind of the British Tom Sawyer in a way. It was, uh, although it was 20 years before Tom Sawyer, Sawyer the, the characters were close to the same age, I think. Um, but it was published in England uh, and very popular in, in America. Um, and uh, it was uh, uh, a kind of a disguised memoir of, uh, of the author's own experience uh, at the rugby school in the mid 1830s. Um, uh, the first time I ever heard of Tom Brown School Days was not in historical research. Uh, it was when I was a kid and I was rummaging around in my, uh, my, the, the farmhouse in Middle Tennessee where my great grandfather grew up. Uh, and I found a, a copy of this in the attic there, a very old copy that, that he had read as a kid back in the, in the 1800s. Um, so I, I knew that this was a, a, a a, a book that was well known here. And, I, and sure enough, I, I did some research recently and found out that the book was mentioned several times in Tennessee uh, newspapers in the 1850s. Um, so uh, it, it was well known uh, here, certainly. The author's name was, was Thomas Hughes, and, and we'll have more about him uh, and his connection to, uh, to Knoxville later. But, uh, but his uh, chapter five of, of uh, Tom Brown School Days is called Rugby and football. Again, this is 1857, and this is uh, this is uh, uh, in in uh, in England uh, that this uh, chapter is about. But he describes in this chapter a a radical variant of of football as it was known then, the sport that we know now as soccer. But at rugby, they had just a very very eccentric version of soccer. And uh, let's look at that uh, that picture, uh, Paul, of the of the yeah. This is uh, this is actually from uh, the novel and a, a a a an image of people playing rugby at rugby. Um, they they called it uh, football, but it was it was very much unlike football anybody else played. It was rugby football, um, but it was uh, it had several as as the author describes in in this chapter five rugby and football. It. It, it, uh, this, it's, a, it's a game with a lot more physical contact than soccer has. Um, it's a game uh, where, you, unlike soccer, you could pick up the ball and carry it in some circumstances. Uh, it, was a, it was a game where you could kick, a, uh, kick the ball through a field goal. Um, and uh, the field goal was described in the book uh, as a gigantic gallows of two poles, 18 feet high, fixed upright in the ground, some 14 feet apart, 
with a crossbar running from one to the other at the height of 10 feet or thereabouts. And you see a, a, an example of that uh, goalpost, which looks not unlike a, a, a goalpost, perhaps at a, at, a, at, a, at a high school or something in, in, in America. In fact, the, uh, the uh, height of the, the bar is exactly the same height as, uh, as American football uh, today. But also in the, in the, uh, in the chapter that describes uh, the, the, the game in detail, a uh, very complicated game as, as American football is too, it uses a lot of words that had not, were not previously familiar in terms of uh, sport. Uh, one, one, the word punt uh, appears in there. The, word, the phrase drop kick, kickoff, uh, goalpost, offsides or off your sides, as they said in the book, and scrimmage or scrummage, as they, as they describe in the book. Um, a, 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 a guy uh, uh, warns the kid, Tom Brown, as he begins his, uh, his, his uh, education and various kinds of education at, uh, at rugby school. He said, you'll be a month uh, learning the rules of this, of this game and he refers to the intricacies and the great science of football. Um, but uh, anyway, this was a, uh, this really caught people's attention. It was a, it was a game that no one in America had ever heard of. And, uh, and, and it was, even though it was, it dated back in rugby to the 1830s, it was not that well known in England at the time. You know, it was mainly just a, an eccentric rugby school uh, uh, thing until, until Thomas Hughes uh, wrote about it. Well, of course, uh, what happened after 1857 in America, it was the Civil War. Um, and, uh, and it kind of, uh, put everything on hold for a while in terms of sports development. But after the Civil War in 1869 and more so in the 1870s, there was the development of something called American uh, football. And it was very similar in some ways to this rugby sport that had been, had been described in uh, Thomas Hughes' uh, uh, book. Uh, and it, it's, it's interesting to, to consider that the players, the first players who began playing American football or some version of American football, and there were several different versions of it. Um, some that were more like soccer, some that were more like rugby, um, uh, some of them kind of in between, um, were, uh, were all people who had been kids and kind of kids growing up reading uh, adventure books like Tom Brown's School Days. Uh, and this was, uh, uh, they, they were Civil War veterans, but they may have remembered at age eight or 10 reading, reading this, this very popular book uh, just before the Civil War. Um, Harvard in particular began experimenting more with a rugby, a rugby style of football that had more carrying and, and, uh, and, and, and more than, more, more than the, you know, the soccer that people were somewhat more familiar with. It was mainly known in the Northeast, uh, especially in the Ivy League, uh, as, as kind of a kind of a droll pastime associated with Boston and New York. Uh, then it, it jumped to the West Coast and uh, it, it was uh, and caught on a little bit in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it was slow to catch on in the South. Um, here in Knoxville, our sport was baseball in those days. Uh, in fact, Knoxville's baseball team, the Reds, uh, won a, the Southern Championship in Atlanta in, uh, in 1879. Uh, there's little mention in the, uh, uh, in the 1870s and in early 1880s of, uh, of, of interest in football or rugby here. Uh, but meanwhile, sometime in the 1870s and early 80s, uh, uh, I've, and I've learned this only through reading uh, memories of people who, who uh, were were witnesses or were participants in this. Some Irish immigrants in the area that it was called Irish Town, the north side of downtown, uh, began playing uh, rugby uh, on uh, right along the railroad tracks. If you know where the uh, White Lily building is, that was originally a, a rugby pitch uh, in the early 1880s. Uh, but this was apparently just something that was played purely within Irish Town and a uh, few Knoxvillians from uh, there were not Irish even noticed it much going on. It was just down there kind of in its own place and they might've been curious about it, but it didn't really didn't seem to get in the newspaper uh, at, at the time. Um, meanwhile, uh, Thomas Hughes, uh, the guy that had written Tom Brown's School Days back in 1857 was, was still around. He had uh, had quite a development of his career, uh, unusual. Uh, he, he was, uh, had written this novel, novel about childhood, uh, but he was so popular partly because of the novel uh, that he was, uh, he, he became a, 
was was elected to parliament uh, and he uh, was al allied with the uh, the new christian socialist movement of the era uh, he was uh, uh, notable for a few things when he's elected to British Parliament. One was that uh, that he he uh, supported uh, elementary education, public education, in in England. Um, another was that uh, uh, this was during the time of Disraeli and Gladstone, that kind of classic era of of, of British uh, uh, British politics in the 19th century, Victorian England. Uh, but uh, but he was also notable for his support of the Union in the in the Civil War, um, which was a little bit unusual in England because England uh, didn't necessarily support slavery, but they were they really relied heavily uh, the uh, the knitting mills in England relied very heavily on the cotton uh, uh, cotton imports, and and they were hoping that the this could keep up that the South uh, the the commerce from the south and the and the massive quantities of cotton they were getting there could could remain so many english people were were supporting the confederacy uh thomas hughes was not he was uh, as i mentioned he was uh, he was for the union um but uh but anyway he was he was in 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 office in in parliament for about nine years uh, uh but uh when he was finally uh, finally voted out, I, I think actually it was his support for public education. It sounds like that was uh, was controversial. Uh, he wanted a new quest. Um, there had been a financial panic in England in 1873, uh, a, a terrible depression. Uh, there were uh, many people unemployed, even some nobles uh, who were just looking around, uh, looking for a, not only a, an income, but kind of a kind of a reason uh, a reason for being. And uh, many of them were just intrigued with this kind of uh, utopian ideal of, you know, what if we could just leave civilization behind and live out in the woods? I bet we could we could do better, you know, just out in the woods fending for ourselves than we are in, in this uh, in this uh, in this you know, complicated and unstable uh, economy. Um, but they uh, uh, but they uh, but they just wanted to leave everything behind and live out in the woods. And and, and Thomas Hughes, the same guy who's the novelist and former member of Parliament. Uh, became fascinated with the idea of uh, creating a, a new kind of a Christian socialist British colony in America, kind of a, a new utopia in the Cumberland Mountains, and uh, specific, more specifically in uh, in Morgan County, Tennessee. Um, he began purchasing land uh, in in Tennessee, and and, uh, and and he found out that that was a very complicated issue. And that's Thomas Hughes himself, right there, in about the time that he was working on on this new settlement in, in America. Uh, he uh, built uh, kind of a, 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 what, what he hoped to be uh, this, this utopia that would attract people, especially like the, 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 the unlanded gentry uh, to, come to uh, come to America and, and, uh, and live like gentlemen, uh, if, if a little bit rough edged in the woods. Um, but uh, but he, uh, he, he found out that buying this wild land in, uh, in the Cumberland Mountains of Tennessee was very complicated. So he enlisted an attorney uh, from Knoxville whose name was Oliver Perry Temple, O.P. Temple. Uh, he had lived uh, on in, in Melrose. Some of you may be old enough to remember when uh, a part of Volunteer Boulevard was called Temple Avenue. It was from uh, Cumberland Avenue to, uh, to uh, uh, Circle Park, but that was, uh, that was Temple's uh, neighborhood more or less. Um, uh, Temple Avenue had been named for him, Temple Court. Some people remember that, uh, that apartment uh, building there. And his daughter was Mary Boyce Temple, who was a well-known uh, uh, feminist and her, her house is still standing downtown. Um, but uh, anyway, O.P. Temple is one of the more durable and devoted members of UT's Board of Trustees in, in history. Um, was on the, on the Board of Trustees for almost half a century, I believe. Um, he was more influential on UT's growth than many uh, than many presidents are, but he worked closely with Thomas Hughes for for many years. Uh, they and in September of 1880, uh, they they thought it would be great to bring Thomas Hughes to Knoxville and have you know meet meet our our uh, our, our leading citizens and you know because he was going to be here in the neighborhood anyway, working with uh, with rugby and working with with uh, O.P. Temple. So they had a, a big, like a, a four day uh, fet for him here. And he finally found a place in the schedule that he could come come by and spend as much time in Knoxville. Um, they, they picked him up at the, at the train station where the, the Southern station is now. Um, 
and uh, and he got in, the, in a carriage with uh, three of the most distinguished citizens of fasting. I would love to uh, wish someone were transcribing their conversation. The people he, he rode in the carriage with uh, were uh, with, were Perez Dickinson, uh, famous for his is is uh, he was a merchant prince, uh, just one of the people they called a merchant prince. He made a lot of money as a merchant, but he had a great big farm, this this kind of glorious experimental uh, uh, farm uh, along the river that he called Island Home. Uh, it was right along where Island Home neighborhood is and where the School for the Deaf is now. Um, but he was one of the people riding with, uh, with, with Hughes. Another was Opie Temple, of course. Uh, one was the president of U at the University of Tennessee, which was newly called the University of Tennessee. And that, that president was named Thomas Humes, very similar name, uh, Humes, not Hughes. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, it's interesting to think of these people, uh, uh, Thomas Hughes, Perez Dickinson, O.P. Temple, and Thomas Humes. Uh, three of them were authors. Uh, Temple and Humes wrote two of the best uh, accounts of the Civil War from first-person memories and, and research uh, that we have. Um, and uh, and, and uh, all three of them were connected to UT in one way or another. And, and one of them was the UT president and one was the longest serving uh, trustee in, in history. Uh, so it was, uh, it was kind of a, a, an interesting intellectual uh, literary group that uh, they rode along with, with Thomas, Thomas Hughes. They probably were handpicked for that reason. But where they went was, uh, 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 where they rode was uh, to, uh, to uh, a, a, a mansion called the, uh, the Cowan Mansion. Um, it was, uh, it was, and this is, here's a picture of it, a kind of pretty rare picture, but a, uh, this was, believe it or not, this is Cumberland Avenue. And, uh, and the building, I'll mention in a minute, but the building in the uh, kind of center right uh, area is still standing. And uh, I'll, I'll see if, if some of you, you know where it is, think about that, I'll mention in a minute. But this was the Cowan Mansion. It was one of the show places in Knoxville. It was, uh, and the Cowans were a, a very uh, successful merchant family. They had connections to, they were kin to Perez Dickinson, cousins or, or maybe a sister-in-law or something, but, but uh, they, were, they had Massachusetts uh, uh, associations uh, in the family and uh, they were actually kin to uh, Emily Dickinson, the poet. And in fact, um, she corresponded with people living in this house uh, when she lived up at, at Amherst in, in, in Massachusetts. Um, but the, uh, when, uh, when uh, Thomas Hughes uh, visited the Cowan Mansion, uh, they, they described, uh, the, the newspaper described the beautiful and inviting, inviting gardens. And that whole area that you see, that wooded area behind the house uh, is, is, the, uh, is the gardens of, of, of the place. Beautiful inviting grounds with a great profusion of shrubs and flowers dotted here and there with the beautiful water jets spouting and playing around. Um, I, I would love to have, have seen that. It's, it's, uh, uh, but they, uh, the, the party got there, they, and by this time it was a much larger group. Uh, they, they browsed the gardens. The guests included multiple Knoxville celebrities, uh, including uh, uh, Knoxville's first Republican congressman, who was also a former uh, ambassador to Turkey. And at the time that he, he visited uh, and met Thomas Hughes here, he was, he had a national post. He was U.S. Postmaster General and his, his name uh, was Horace Maynard, uh, a fascinating guy, a very interesting career he had. Um, but he, he was one of the, one of the honored guests. There were several former mayors, including uh, Joseph Jaques, who was, uh, we mentioned last week, uh, our only uh, English uh, born mayor, um, an interesting guy himself. I'm sure they uh, had swapped some uh, some memories of uh, of, uh, of of England, um, but uh, 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 another mayor, also foreign-born, was Peter Staub, uh, the Swiss-born uh, theater builder and sometimes Swiss consul to the U.S., uh, who was later U.S. consul to Switzerland. So th these were international uh, international folks, um, and who uh, was soon to be re-elected mayor. Um, and I can't help noticing, I don't know if anybody there uh, uh, brought this up, but uh, Peter Staub had done something very similar to what uh, Thomas Hughes was trying to do at, in, in Rugby, Tennessee. Peter Staub, uh, about 20 years earlier, had tried to found a, a kind of a utopian colony in the, in the Cumberland Mountains uh, south of, of 
rugby uh, called Grootly, uh, G-R-U-E-T-L-I, which I think means meadow. Uh, but this was a uh, this was supposed to be this wonderful place for a Swiss Swiss people to come, where, where they could speak their their chosen language. I think uh, Stav spoke German, uh, but they were uh, there. He invited Swiss people to come there, and and uh, and and many did, and many were were extremely disappointed with the accommodations in uh, in Grootly. And and some of them went back, and some of them uh, got angry at at at, at Staub for misrepresenting it, and Staub just moved back to Knoxville. He he just uh, he, he just gave up on it altogether, and I just can't think help but think that he might have had something uh, a, a similar a warning to make to uh, to Mr. Hughes, um, that uh, because uh, rugby's uh, fate was not all that all that different. Um, but anyway, they all, uh, after browsing the gardens, they all went inside for lunch. And uh, inside this, this, this uh, wonderful house, uh, elaborately decorated house, uh, there was a parlor. And in the middle of the parlor, in a place of honor, as if on a pedestal, there was a table, a marble top table, with a, an open copy of a book called Tom Brown School Days. The first book to describe rugby football uh, to America was right there. In the in the uh, in the house uh, to greeting the uh, the, the uh, visitors to this to this place, um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, uh, I we can only guess that people what people talked about there, but uh, but but anyway, this um, uh, the Cowan Mansion is long gone, uh, as you might uh, gather. Um, it's uh, there's you know, what uh, dormitory development and, and stuff over there. But they, the gardener's cottage is still there. Uh, that, that cottage that you see in the center right is right on the corner of 16th and White Avenue. And I'm glad to say it's been recently uh, renovated and seems to be likely to last for, um, for a while longer. Uh, but uh, it's interesting at the time though that they visited here that when there were so many English people in the party, that the, uh, the the Cowans were were proud that they had an English gardener because the English knew how to do gardens and, and he lived in that in that house um, at at the time. Um, but um, but I, I I I don't know if you have to be kind of fanciful in your thinking as I as I tend to be, uh, but to note that this garden party in 1880 featuring Hughes, um, the uh, the guy that popularized uh, rugby football. Uh, was within clear view of UT's Hill. Um, and in fact, uh, it was hardly more than a, a good punt away from the first football field uh, that UT ever used, the, the place that was called Waite Field, which is right on Cumberland Avenue. In fact, this picture is taken from very close to where Waite Field was. Um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, some of this is speculative, but uh, but they gave tour uh, uh, Hughes the gr the grand tour of Knoxville, and including uh, a, an, af an evening at Perez Dickinson's fabulous uh, retreat across the river at Island Home, um, and uh, and you know just across the Gay Street Bridge, turn left, and you're and you're there. Um, it was a, a place that a lot of surprisingly a lot of people visited, uh, and and Perez Dickinson was fairly liberal about the people he let visit there. He was. Uh, a few years later, the the Afro American League, which was a a, a national uh, civil rights party composed of of, of African American men and women, uh, were given a, the grand tour of the place as well um, when they had a big conference in Knoxville. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, he was here for several days. Did did he ever mention football or suggest it uh, uh, as something? Uh, to the did he you know to, to to when he was riding in carriages with Thomas Humes, the president of UT, or with his uh, his lawyer O.P. Temple, the the guy who was so influential at UT, did he say this is something maybe you ought to try at your school? It was a lot of fun at rugby. Um, I, we don't know exactly, of course, but um, but I'm uh, I'm just I'm just fascinated with this guy. That there aren't many towns that have a connection to this guy that that was the first one to popularize. Uh, rugby football, but but he was he was here. Um, he uh, he he left here and went on to rugby Tennessee uh, to begin his big experiment, which uh, which didn't work out as well as he as he hoped, of course. Um, but he stayed, of course, in, in in touch with Temple. Temple was trying to handle his legal business here for for some years, and uh, about uh, three years later, his daughter Mary Boyce Temple, um, who I mentioned later, a, a suffragist. 
uh, visited England. Uh, they had a lot of money, and she she did a lot of traveling abroad. Uh, uh, did uh, went was a state commissioner of the Paris Exposition a few years later, but she visited rugby England and made a point to to see the football field and mentioned it in a in a letter that she wrote back home uh, that was published in the newspaper in uh, 1883. Um, but uh, in uh, in February 1884, um, this is just three years and a few months after Hugh's visit, uh, we find the very first mention that I've ever found, uh, at least, uh, of, of football, uh, a football team or a football club here in Knoxville. And that was in February of 1884. There was a paragraph, uh, uh, just a single paragraph in the Daily Chronicle. Uh, but it and it seems may may include you know, what sounds like an obscure joke. It says a football club, and they spell football foot hyphen ball club has been organized on the hill, and of course they mean the the UT hill. All cadets, and they called uh, in those days uh, UT was a semi-military uh, academy, uh, partly to get uh, the Morrill Act funding. Um, but um, but it was uh, but it said all cadets should join this uh, club and learn how to kick neatly and beautifully. For there is nothing like knowing how to kick well and to the point. What do they mean by that? I don't know exactly, but, um, but that there are several references to football clubs. Almost every year, there's a brief reference and, and, and tantalizing, but maddeningly obscure reference to a football club of some sort on the UT Hill. Um, there's uh, in 1885. There's reference to the uh, football being played on the what they call the lower parade ground, uh, which was uh, which was my best guess is what they call the lower parade ground was what's now the corner of of Cumberland Avenue and Phil Fulmer, uh, which is what was later called Wait Wait Field, uh, the, uh, the 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 first home of the Vols, basically the, the first home field home uh, of of the. Uh, the Tennessee Vols was there right on the corner. Um, was was this more this football more like soccer or rugby? We don't know exactly. Um, but they had some other encouragement from other places during this time. Uh, in 1887, I think we moved to the next uh, slide, Paul. Um, is uh, there was a, 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 a as I mentioned. Uh, a, a, Rugby style football uh, and and these words were kind of in these days sometimes used interchangeably, but uh, but American football was was really catching on in the Ivy Leagues, and a lot of the the young men of the the old families of Knoxville uh, uh, went to the uh, went to Ivy League schools, Yale and Princeton especially, and um, and uh, and one was Thomas Lee McClung. We, we called him Lee McClung. In fact, on the field he was known as Bum McClung. For, for reasons I, I, I don't I, I don't know, but uh, but this was uh, uh, Walter Camp uh, by the way he, he, he wrote a book called American Football in 1894 I included a picture of of Lee McClung. Walter Camp is considered the father of American football, the guy that finally codified the rules that are somewhat more that made it different from from English uh, English rugby. Um, but but he he was a Yale uh, student in 1887. Uh, he joined the football team. He was a, a, a multi-talented athlete, but he became a, such a big football star at Yale that uh, that he was uh, uh, that he uh, was, was was became a national a national celebrity for this. Uh, he was uh, uh, was uh, the highest scorer in uh, in uh, in. And Yale history up to that point. In fact, he, he, I think they let him get away with things they wouldn't let him get away with now because he, he scored hundreds and hundreds of points in his, in his, just in his college career at Yale. Uh, uh, but, uh, but they, uh, uh, but he, he maybe even though it's a, it was a somewhat different game and it's hard to compare. But he's, some people have called him the, the highest scorer in football history to this day. And he was from Knoxville, uh, from the the the, the well known McClung family. Family here. He was the brother of uh, the the McClung that had the warehouses and um, and and founded the McClung Collection, C. M. McClung, um, and uh, and also the brother of Frank McClung, I believe, for whom the uh, oh, no no the the son of Frank McClung, for whom the museum at UT is is named. Um, but anyway, he was a big big star, and people in Knoxville who Knoxville newspapers had had never had 
in the sports pages anything about following national football, really. Uh, the uh, brief notes about football clubs on the Hill were kind of in, in, uh, in little gossip columns about UT, not in the sports page. But suddenly Knoxville was paying attention to football because this guy from Knoxville was becoming a big, big star. Um, at, at Yale. And of course, UT, again, didn't have a competitive football team that we that left any records, at least, and uh, at this time, but but Lee McClung at Yale was 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 uh, was was uh, causing a big stir. Uh, meanwhile, about uh, about two years later, a uh, down uh, about 25 miles south of here uh, at Marable College, uh, a very unlikely figure began forming a football team there. And his name was Kin Takahashi. Uh, he was from Japan. Uh, he was a student from Japan who uh, had uh, just had come to America about a year earlier. And uh, as a teenager, quick learner, as, uh, as teenagers are, uh, he, he was fascinated with, he, he first landed in the Oakland uh, area, California area, uh, where they, I mentioned they were already uh, playing some football sort of based on the Ivy League uh, football. And uh, and was became fascinated with it, and he he had a football and brought it to uh, to Maribel College when he uh, he transferred there. Um, he he came to Maribel College with another Japanese student. Uh, Maribel College had a reputation as a very progressive place. Maribel College was a blue knot in the 1880s and 90s was a was a multiracial place where there were Asians and black people all studying together. At, at Maryville College, and he and he he liked he was a he was a Christian and was was liked the kind of the religious aspect of Maryville College as well, but he uh, he founded a football team at Maryville College, and, and he was probably the first one to carry an actual football in uh, in, uh, in in uh, in in East Tennessee. I think he this was after his graduation. He was he was kind of more like a manager at this point, but he's the guy standing in the middle in black with the football it kind of stands out in the, in this picture, but uh, yeah, a great old picture of, of uh, one of the earliest uh, uh, football, football teams in, uh, in, in the area. And they look pretty proud of themselves, don't they? they and they look, they look older than uh, 19 or 20, uh, don't they? Uh, but that's about the age that they, that they probably were. Um, but, but, uh, but he was a very small guy, and, but he played quarterback as a, as a, on, on the team and, and, and was just loved to come up with complex plays that would baffle the, uh, the opposition. Um, and uh, was just, I think it was partly attracted to the, uh, to the intellectual side of it. Um, but, uh, but that's probably the, perhaps the smallest uh, college quarterback that we've, uh, that we've ever fielded in, in East Tennessee. And there's another picture of, of Ken Takahashi uh, with, uh, with his uh, Maribel, I don't know if they call him the Scots then yet or not, but that was, uh, that's the, the 95 team. And, uh, but uh, anyway, th by this time, uh, uh, UT was, uh, was working on, on, uh, on, on, on football. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, meanwhile, there had been a, uh, a, another effort to start a football team. Uh, there was not a college team. There was a, just a Knoxville team in 1890. Uh, this is before, still before UT had a team. Uh, there was a uh, what they called a rugby team uh, organized at the Hattie House, but in the in the articles, the words rugby and football are used interchangeably, as if they think of it as the same thing, and it may have been close to the same thing. Uh, they they met and organized at the Hattie House, which was the nicest hotel in in downtown Knoxville, later known as the Imperial Hotel, and later replaced by the Farragut. Uh, hotel, and it's worth mentioning that the first known uh, uh, organization of a football team in Knoxville in 1890 was on the same site as the formation of the Southeastern Conference in, in uh, 1932, when that big convention uh, boiled itself down and, and created this new conference called the Southeastern Conference at the Farragut Hotel uh, in, in 32. So, but I, I there's a seems like there's a bit of resonance uh, in in that on that uh, on that fascinating corner. Uh, but they uh, they organized a uh, a, a Knoxville team. Um, we 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 don't know exactly what they did. We know that 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 December, in December 1890, Lee McClung himself uh, came back from Yale for for uh, for Christmas holidays and worked with the team a good deal. So that that's really something to have. It was like having Peyton Manning or somebody come you know come join your 
your your high school team or something like that for a, for a, for a couple of weeks. And uh, but that was uh, that that was uh, that was the beginning of a, a Knoxville team that may have played. Uh, we think uh, it they they played against uh, Ken, Ken Takahashi's team uh, out of Marable. Uh, but the fact is, there aren't many records. Uh, there are hardly any records of of, of that of that era. Uh, UT uh, University of Tennessee on its hill uh, fielded a team in in late 1891, uh, organized by Henry Denlinger, who was a Princeton player, again an Ivy Leaguer. Um, but uh, they uh, uh, just played one game that year in 1891, their very first season, and they lost it to uh, to Sewanee. Uh, he was, uh, is not quite the football power that they were in the 1890s uh, anymore, but they were, uh, Sewanee was much most famous. In fact, Sewanee and Vanderbilt were the two, the two teams to beat in, in Tennessee, uh, before UT was. Um, but, uh, but the following year in 1892, they beat, uh, Ken Takahashi's famous Marable team. So that was, uh, that was, uh, their, their first triumph. Um, their first field I mentioned was Wait Field at Cumberland Avenue at the foot of the hill, uh, kind of the uh, uh, south or the northwestern foot of, uh, of, of the college hill there was where Wait Field was. Wait Field was, uh, was not a regulation, uh, kind of a, a field. Uh, part of it was uphill. Uh, there was some exposed uh, uh, rock in the field uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 punts would sometimes go bouncing off onto Cumberland Avenue. But uh, but anyway, it, 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 football caught on uh, nonetheless at this at this field. It was sometimes used as a as a parade ground. Um, but uh, uh, that that was uh, th th there's uh, you know a good deal more to uh, to, uh, to to UT football. We have a few more pictures of UT, don't we? Let's just run through some of those if if, if they're handy there, Paul. Okay, this is a Chilhowee Park. Uh, just from the era, we included just because they they played some early games at Chilhowee Park in, in these in, in the 18, 1890s in the in very early 1900s. Wakefield was not ideal for big crowds, but Chilhowee Park was better for that. They played more baseball probably than football, but they played some some UT football there as well, and, and, and we don't uh, often remember that. Here's an early uh, an early football team from UT, uh, 1896. Um, but uh, and another uh, from a, a building I wish I could identify. And uh, yeah, as Paul mentioned today, they look like uh, look, they look like escape prisoners, don't they? In the in those uh, striped uh, striped jerseys. But just uh, several early, and that looks like it's on the side of the hill, maybe above uh, above Wait Field. And uh, 1913, we're getting uh, not quite into the modern era now, but uh, but they're still going for the horizontal stripes. And here, here I mentioned Wait Field. Uh, this is actually a, a, a more becoming picture of it than most descriptions have it. Um, uh, but it was right there on the on the bottom of the hill uh, there. But, um, and here's uh, an, an aeroplane view of uh, the University of Tennessee uh, with, uh, and this is uh, looking from above what's now Neyland Stadium area, uh, just to the, maybe just barely to the east of there, looking uh, kind of north, northwest with at Ares Hall. This must be about 1921 or so. And uh, uh, Wakefield was on the other side. I think they've already, at this time, have already built uh, uh, the beginning of uh, Shields Watkins Field, uh, which was a regulation field, our first one in 1921, uh, that that actually uh, obeyed the laws of, of college football, um, and uh, and wasn't quite as dangerous because it didn't have any exposed rock uh, on it. Um, hey Jack, here is the Cowan Cottage there. I you know, th that might be the Woodruff. Uh, uh, I think the Cowan Cottage is more uh, farther over to the left there. That might be the yeah, it might be harder to hard to sort out, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, you can I, see I the Rose Bowl there up on the upper left corner. That's right, the, or the Rose Hole, they called it. Yeah, that's the right. Rose Hole, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that was a place where they, that, they there was a joke, uh, uh, The uh, it was a big uh, depression. Paul, it's, it's, you see that little bridge at the top? Oh, of that? Yeah. yeah, the Rose Hole. That was a depression, it was like a big, a giant sinkhole there. 
that's where uh, later was Ramsey's Cafeteria and the uh, and the uh, Masonic Hall, which is still there. And that giant, uh, I guess, is not a hole at all anymore because they have a giant uh, residential building there. Um, but it was still a, a noticeable depression up until they built that building about what ten years ago or so. Um, but they used to have uh, have, have foot, football scrimmages and and uh, pep rallies and thing a lot of football related things there in, 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 in time past. But here's an early picture of Shields Watkins Field in uh, in probably in 1921. This is when they were actually cutting it, uh, putting it together. And this is where you know, long before they were even stands there before Neyland Stadium. But they they had the field there first, and that's uh, that's where it, where it lay right by the right by the river as it still as it still is. That's a railroad bridge across, and there was an island across in the river at that time. Um, but uh, anyway, this is a uh, uh, so UT has a has a has a pretty deep history in football, but has some some prehistory as well. Um, I, I want to mention brings back to Thomas Hughes a little bit. Um, his dream uh, rugby Tennessee was uh, was a very slow failure. Uh, some people stayed there. Over the years, most people uh, drifted away. Uh, it was not at, at all what he hoped it would be. It's kind of a, a refuge. It's, it's really hard to just as, as romantic as it seems to go out and and live in the wild. Uh, it's uh, it's really hard work to to make that make that happen, as the earliest pioneers learned. Um, but uh, and then Hughes died in in disappointment in in uh, in in, uh, in England in 1896. And uh, the Knoxville Journal and Tribune ran a, a pretty uh, a lengthy uh, tribute to Hughes, uh, uh, more so than you would expect uh, a, a paper to, to write of a, of, a, of, a, of a former member of parliament. Um, but uh, they wrote, uh, uh, and, and they were talking mainly about his book, the influence of his book, Tom Brown's School Days, from back in 1857. This is what the Journal and Tribune wrote. The Journal and Tribune written by, uh, uh, edited by, uh, by uh, 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 William Rule. Um, his influence and altogether was, uh, was altogether good and pure and his memory will be held in tender recollection by millions of men and women of both sides of the water. Uh, and then they quoted uh, an editorial from the New York Press uh, which talked about uh, his influence on America's rugby style football. Uh, thousands of boys have read with delight of the scrimmage and the great kickoff in the first book football match uh, and went on to talk about Tom Brown school days uh, being an influence that was mostly moral uh, and that it was the first novel that his first novel produced a new vitality in America. Uh, and had shown an unusual positive influence on the whole world. That's a lot to say about a novel uh, about your about your youth at a in a school that was was intended partly for for young boys. Um, but uh, so rugby Tennessee uh, did not last, as we know. Uh, although it's a it's a it's fascinating. It left a fascinating uh, 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 remnant of itself that you can visit today. And the I think the, the library is named for Thomas Hughes. At uh, at rugby, uh, and if you haven't been there, it's it's definitely worth the worth the trip out out that way. About about an hour away from here, I guess, by car. Um, but uh, but America's version of uh, of of, uh, of rugby did did last. Uh, uh, rugby football did last. Um, it it football would have arrived here anyway. Of course, it was kind of uh, swirling around. It was in the air in the 1880s and 90s. Um, but we, uh, I think, have a little bit more uh, uh, literary uh, street cred uh, than other than other uh, other football towns have. But I appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, maybe I don't know if that gives you some some perspective on on uh, on this this crazy phenomenon called uh, called UT football. Are there any uh, any questions or comments out there? Uh, any? Yeah, we have a couple more slides, by the way. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Let, let's. Uh, okay, yeah, good, good. Yeah, the the, uh, the souvenir program from 1909. Um, that was, uh, I guess they handed those out at, uh, at Waite Field. And, oh, oh yeah, of course, it, we, we have a, a bit of an epilogue about, uh, about Lee McClung, Thomas Lee McClung. Uh, he was the uh, uh, 22nd treasurer of the United States. Now that's kind of, has become kind of a ceremonial title and is usually uh, a title held by a woman in, in recent decades.
but for most of an uh, early history, it was held by a man, and it was a it was it, he was actually the guy that was in charge of the money that the nation's money uh, would would write. You know, he would a accept a check for for millions and millions of dollars from the his predecessor, and would 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 take you know uh, would be in charge of of all the all the cash in in, in America uh, at, at at the time. He was treasurer for for nineteen oh nine from nineteen oh nine to nineteen twelve. And his name was on every uh, every dollar bill minted during that during that time. This is his grave, which is in in Old Gray Cemetery, uh, kind of a classical uh, grave. Uh, it's right in the McClung, well-known McClung plot, which looks kind of like a like a city, a necropolis in the middle of um, of the of Old Gray Cemetery. Uh, a fascinating place to walk around. Uh, but he uh, he died rather young. He was uh, he, he was uh, in in his uh, 40s, I believe, and died in England. Interestingly, uh, in London, he he uh, after he left the Treasury Department, he uh, just took off and, and began uh, exploring different different faiths. Was was interested in the Baha'i movement. Uh, never married, uh, but uh, but he, here's a here's an example of an old dollar bill. And if you look very closely in the lower right hand corner beside Ulysses Grant's uh, head there is the name Lee McClung and he signed he, he signed all these uh, and there, there, there are thousands of these out there with the name of this early football star from Knoxville uh, uh, you know signed by Lee McClung but that's his uh, that's that's his story and that may be the last one is that it, this is a silver certificate by the way uh, from uh, from uh, from a, a one dollar bill, so so took that. But anybody, uh, anybody want to add anything? Uh, any any questions or anything uh, uh, about uh, about the origins of of football or or rugby or or anything else? Uh, Jack, I have a question because yeah. I remember I was talking to Brent about this before dinner, and we were talking about there was some column that you did ages ago. I think it was Metropulse or something. And you talked about UT football and how it didn't catch on real easily. And you quoted a minister who was, had written either a letter to the editor or he published something that, uh, get against the practice of football. It was really awful. He was talking, he said terrible things about it. So I'd like to yeah. know who he was. And then there was also, I think you did a story about a football player that was injured and later yeah. died, not necessarily of his injury, but he, he didn't live much longer after he yeah. played that might have been the same the same column because there the, the first time there was a lot of uh, of of uh, denunciation of football that I know of was when a guy named Bennett Jarrett his name was yeah that's uh, was uh, was seriously in, had a serious head injury in a in a game against Vanderbilt in uh, what nineteen fourteen or fifteen I think uh, and he he uh, was permanently disabled and uh, and. Uh, wheelchair chair bound the rest of his very short life and he did die indirectly of of, uh, of that football injury and uh, I think even uh, even uh, uh, president Ayers was 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 kind of regretted that uh, that they he'd ever let UT play football on on campus um, this I think the injury actually happened at at, at, at Vanderbilt but he was not the only one. But I didn't know that at the time. I think it was the 1930s. Another player whose name I don't remember right now was 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 injured and and subsequently died uh, in a football game. Um, so it uh, it's a dangerous sport and it still is, of course, as uh, as as people have become aware lately. I have an ulterior motive because you know I, I, there there's not a whole lot of UT ghost stories that are actually provable. Yeah. But I'm trying to look into some gridiron ghosts here. I just I remembered that you had said that. So that's that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed UT's. Uh, I think changes almost by semester. They the, the, the ghost stories are. are yeah, most of them have absolutely no historic <laughs> basis. But, but I, I try to run you know run this down and, and check into it whenever yeah. I hear one. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. I, I look forward to seeing what you find. I think one of the interesting things is who the. Uh, big teams that Tennessee played that beat them like Sewanee back then. Yeah. Sewanee was tough in those days. <laughs> and that was what, uh, what when Johnny Major's father, uh, the coach of Sewanee at, at, in, 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 in a, at one time when they were, you know, they were, uh, they were a, uh, they were a competitive team in, in the early days. 
and I, and I mentioned Suwannee and Vanderbilt were the two the two big teams in in, in uh, Tennessee before until Nealon got here in the twenties, and uh, and you know started really really uh, making making UT a, a you know competitive team. UT occasionally beat them. Uh, they had a, a few good years before Nealon, but Nealon really kind of created the old notion of of all mania. I think when people people who weren't even college students started going to, to, to football games. Imagine that, you know. It's, uh, I think Solani still has, uh, in 1899, still had an undefeated season. They, really? they took their train down to, all the way to Texas. It's called the train, they had their own train for the football team and they played a six games in six days throughout the oh. South. One every and I, as if I remember scored. correctly, no one even scored on them. <laughs> so Sawani was a real football power in this area, yeah. even in 1899. So. Well, I, I've seen football teams, football games at, at Sawani, and and they they take it pretty. I shouldn't say seriously because it, I think it's more about drinking beer than football. But they're they're big they're big event football football games are there. But it's, um, it's funny when people cheer, you you smell you smell beer across the field. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a Maryville alum, and I was really, uh, I had learned some of the uh, history of Maryville football before you, because Maryville just uh, celebrated its 200th anniversary. So yeah. as an alum, I got all those uh, notifications, and yeah. they did a lot about uh, the Japanese yeah. student that started yeah. there. So that was really, I'm really glad that you included that tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. They, I mean, he was the first one, and, and I, I think he was kind of shamed UT into the to, to, to look into getting a football team because uh, he was he was the first guy that I know of to carry a football in East Tennessee, um, but uh, but uh, yeah, Ken Takashi they, they still honor him a, a great deal in Maryville. I think they have Ken Takashi Days or something. Yeah, like they that, do a series of uh, uh, like track and field type type events and things. And uh, he was he was a he was a really loved Maryville College and was a great athlete. Uh, unfortunately, he died kind of young, kind of like Lee McClung did. It's kind of surprising how how these these athletes are just just flame out somehow but he he uh, he actually had gone back to, he, he was at Maribel for about 10 years or more and then went back to Japan and and died there his, his the guy he came with by the way was named Sen Katayama and he had a somewhat darker view of America and and uh, was not as happy at Maribel as uh, Ken Takahashi was but Sen Katayama went back to Japan after one year at Maribel College and founded the Japanese Communist Party, and and he's he's actually buried at the Kremlin. Uh, wow! Uh, so, uh, I don't know whether he played football or not, but I don't think he did. Yeah, I don't think they mentioned that in the history. They probably wanted to snuff <laughs> that up for the 200th yeah. anniversary. So. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he's a a, a fascinating story that I, I think very few uh, very few places have any you know a story like that. But, Football has exotic origins. If you think about an English novelist and a Japanese student, and and uh, and, and we think of it as, as just born and bred ball country sort of thing, but but it's uh, and of course it was the Ivy League thing for a while, but um, but it's a it's a I, I love the origin stories of, of holidays and sports and, and everything else. <laughs>